we now move on to asking how good those, those models are. And some of these issues that we're going to um, talk about get, get quite tricky conceptually. And this goes back to a lot of the things that we've, we've talked about in terms of the balance between presences and absences, you know, our kind of weighting or confidence in presences versus absences. The very basic theory of what are we actually trying to predict here? Are we trying to model the niche? Are we trying to characterize the niche? Or are we really trying to predict the distribution? And hopefully you're thinking through these things, but they're, they're going to come back to, to us when, we, when we're starting to ask the question of what makes good modeling. If we want to actually have some statistical evaluation of the models, then um, we're, going to, we're going to be going back to that, to that basic theory. But the goal, just for the next um, few minutes, uh, a, a relatively short introduction to some general concepts about how we um, can uh, evaluate the models, how we can generate some data to evaluate the models, um, and then some of the, the, the most common statistics that are used to evaluate models. And we're really going to um, explain in particular um, two approaches that are most widely used, the kind of binomial test combined with a portion of presences that are, are correctly predicted. And then Tang's going to talk a little bit about the, um, the AUC, or the Area Under the Receiver Operating Characteristic Curve, which is a bit of a mouthful, but we'll, we'll, we'll um, We'll talk you guys through that. Um, that is not to say that we're covering all the possible evaluation statistics that are out there. There are, there are many more, and we're not going to try and give you an overview of, of, of everything that you will see in the literature. But we're going to point you towards the most um, the most common things that you will see and, 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 and potentially use. But we'll also emphasise that this is quite an active area of research, and because of these theoretical reasons, in terms of you know, what are we really trying to model? What's the balance between presences and absences and, and, and these kinds of issues? Um, this is really an area that's um, got a lot of potential for, 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 for you folks and, and for, for others to, to develop new techniques and to come up with new ideas as to how we can better do this. But uh, what we're going to try and do is, 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 is at least introduce you to, 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 to the basics. And, and, and you'll see that actually just to emphasize that I'm going to kind of pick up on, on the, the, the most common ways of looking at, at evaluation when you have applied the threshold. And then the, the approach that Towns going to talk about this AUC is a threshold independent approach. So we've kind of divided it up. So this is coming back to this uh, very basic flow diagram that we've talked about just to emphasize kind of where we're up to. We talked a couple of days ago now about the observed presences and absences. Um, we talked about the GIS databases of environmental variables. These are our temperature variables, precipitation and the like. We talked yesterday about the algorithms, different ways that we can actually build this association between the observed presences and the environmental variables. Tomorrow, and kind of at the end of today, we come on to the, the fun stuff, the applications, but this is just a crucial point, and that's what we're going to focus on this morning in terms of, of how we assess the models. And we keep coming back to this because this is kind of a, a process that you would expect to go through as you are, uh, you know, carrying out one of these um, exercises um, in, in, in your own work. So, what are some of the strategies for, for developing um, data for, for <coughs> calibrating the models and, and, importantly, now for, for testing the models? And just some terminology. There, there, there are different terms that you'll that you'll see in the literature. But we basically talk about calibration and the data that we use to calibrate the models. Those are the actual points, the occurrence records that we use to characterize the niche. That's the process of saying, well, here are some occurrence records, here are some environmental variables, so let's build an association and ask the question, what are the environments that that species is occupying based on these calibration occurrence records? You'll often, you'll often hear the word training as well. It's really a, a term that's most commonly used in, in the machine learning literature because of this process of training the machine, training the model to learn a pattern in your data. So instead of just kind of running an equation and getting an answer, the process is an iterative learning process. So you'll, you'll often hear it, it, it training. But they're, again, they're kind of interchangeable in many ways. We calibrate or we train the model. It's that process of using some data to actually build and construct and parameterize the model. So we talked yesterday a little bit about Maxent um, and, and some of the parameters there, particularly the regularization parameter. Remember, we could change that number and we would get more fit or less fit 
models. Well, that's kind of part of the model calibration process. You're trying to calibrate the model to give you the best answer that you can get for your, for your particular application. Then we'll also talk about testing data, or testing the models, or evaluating evaluating models or evaluation data. Okay, so these are the separate data that we would um, hope have some degree of independence from the, from the data that we use to calibrate the model. And we're going to use that to say, well, now, now we've calibrated the model, how well can that model predict this test data or this evaluation data? Okay, so you'll hear in the literature and you'll hear us talk about training and calibrating, kind of interchangeable, versus um, testing and evaluating. Okay? So how do we come up with data sets to do these different parts of the process? And, and here's just one, one way of viewing these ideas. Suppose that you know, we have 100% of our data, 100% of our occurrence records. Okay? That might be that you have 20 localities, it might be you have 50, uh, 100, uh, 1,000, 10,000. You have a, a, a certain number of occurrence records to, to use if you like. Now one thing that we can do is calibrate the model or train the model based on all of that data and then evaluate the model also based on all of that data. Okay? So we calibrate on the data and then we ask the model, well how well can we now predict that data? And then this arrow here is kind of saying, well this is the, the, the ultimate projection. This is the, the, the projection that we will use for our actual application and our application might be um, you know, say, say diamond field surveys in the same region, we might be looking at invasive species in a different region, we might be um, asking what the um, environment might be like under a different climate scenario, or a different land cover change scenario. This is kind of application side of things that we'll, that we'll come to um, at the end of the day and, and mostly tomorrow. But focusing for now, one thing that we can do then is take our calibration data and our evaluation data and essentially it's the same data set. Now, that you'll see in the literature, um, uh, less frequently now than a few years ago, but can anybody kind of spot an obvious um, issue with, with that approach? What would be our problem here? Yeah, it, it's an, essentially the, 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 the problem is overfitting. Right? The, the problem is, in it, coming back to kind of what, what you said, that the problem is that what we can do, and what we talked to at length about yesterday, is overfit the model to the data set that we have, but then that model won't have any we might term it generalizability, or it won't be a very general model because it won't be able to actually predict some new data that it's challenged with. So particularly this is an issue with some of these new um, uh, very advanced machine learning approaches that can fit very, very complex um, uh, ecological niches, um, but have the potential, as we talked about yesterday, to overfit to our data. So if we overfit to the calibration data that we have, we might think that the model is doing really, really well when we evaluate it on the same data, but then when we make our projection, it's not really doing very well because it's overfit to the calibration data. All right? So what might be an alternative? Well, this is kind of like the, the, the gold standard. So this would be to say, well, let's, let's take all of the data that we have, all of the data that we have access to, everything that we can get hold of, and let's build our model. We'll, we'll, we'll calibrate our model based on those data. Again, it might be a thousand, it might be 20 points, how many records do you have? And then we'll make our projection for our application, and we'll evaluate very specifically for our particular application with some new independent data. Okay? So, and I'll give you an example of this later in the week. Some of the work that we're doing in Madagascar where we're using these models to predict um, areas that are more likely to yield new populations and potentially um, unknown species as well. We build the model on all the data that we have. We then project that back onto the landscape, send the field crews out. The field crews take that data and, and, and and, and use the, the, in effect, the map that we've, that we've given them and generate some new data that we can use to test the model. So it's, it's independently observed or, or collected data after we've built the models that can be used to test the data set. Another thing that we may well, uh, that, we, that we will touch on um, would be we might evaluate in a different region. Say we're interested in invasive species, well we might build the model for um, a particular region. An example I'll give you tomorrow is, is for South Africa. We might actually build the model for South Africa, we'll calibrate the model there, and then we'll project it to other parts of the world, and we'll use data sets from other parts of the world 
to ask whether those species from, in this case, plants from South Africa, are invading other regions of the world. So again, it's a, it's, it's a different data set in a different part of the world that we'll use to test the model. So the example that I'll give, as I say, is from South African plants that are projected, and we, um, not, not we as in myself, but, but colleagues in the field have taken data from, say, Europe, and from New Zealand, and from Australia, and used that data to test how well the model from South Africa can predict the distributions in other parts of the world. Um, another example would be under the different um, climate change scenarios. Of course, it's not really possible going forward in time, but there's been some cool work done um, going back in time, so taking old records, say from a few decades ago, or even fossil data from older, and using those older records to test how well a model calibrated with data from today can predict predictions going back in time. So we might build a model for one time slice, so, you know, for the present day, and predict back to um, earlier in the Holocene. Or we might take data from, we've done this with birds in, 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 in Europe, we might take data from the 1970s, calibrate the model, and then take data from the 1990s or the 2000s, and use that data to test the model. Okay? Under, under different climate change scenarios. So that's kind of, if you like, the idea. That, that, that's the, uh, it still has caveats and limitations and difficulties, but that's Oops, in, in some ways the, uh, the, the, the best that we can do. Oops, pressing the button, sorry about that. Um, but there's an intermediate step. There's an intermediate kind of um, uh, approach that we can take that's very useful um, during the, 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 the kind of model building process. And that is to say, let's take all of the data that we have, all of the data that we have, let's split it into multiple parts. So we might split it into, say, 70% of the data points we're going to use to calibrate the model, to build the model, and then, say, 30% we're going to use to test the model. So taking all the data that we have, 20 points, 100 points, 1,000 points, and we're dividing it into data sets that we're going to use to calibrate or train the model, and relatively independent or at least unseen data, as it is not, not being used, it's not being seen by the, the modeling algorithm, it's not used to calibrate the model, we'll use those data sets to test or evaluate how well the model performs. Then what's usual is that we'll, so we'll calibrate on part of the data set, we'll evaluate on a different part of the data set, and then usually you would put all of your data kind of back in the bag, and you, you use all your data when you actually then come to make the, the, the final prediction that you're going to actually interpret. Um, so, uh, now, when you see in the literature, you know, an evaluation statistic, uh, an ABC score, or a, a, any number of, of, of other statistics that, that, that you might see, that's very frequently this kind of evaluation data. It's saying, I took all of my data, I divided it into parts, and I evaluated on these tests or unseen um, data. So Richard's not feeling very well, so I'm going to take over. Uh, so bear with me if I'm a little bit rocky, simply because sometimes we look at and think at, think about these images just a little bit different. But we wrote the model evaluation chapter of the book together, so it ought to work, right? So just bear with me. So Richard had just talked to you about how this is kind of your gold standard. Maybe you're using specimen records to build your model and an observational data source to test your model. Or maybe uh, one team goes out and does tracking with one sort of track, another team goes out and tracking with another sort of track. Uh, so this is, this is genuine independence. I will mention to you one thing, which is any biases in the initial production of data that remain in the second, the independent sort of data, will really lead to a false sense of good performance by the model. So remember what I showed you about uh, roads and environments in Israel, right? Remember the, the roads were avoiding the dry parts of the country. Well. If you go out and sample two teams independently, same region, different region, different time, different resolutions, 
If you go out and sample, but both teams use those roads, then both teams are going to find that the species avoids dry regions of the country. So it's just a little caution that any bias that's shared between two data sources works in favor of finding model significance and creativity. So as Richard was pointing out, um, more commonly we don't have the luxury of completely independent data sources. Most of you kind of came in with one set of data, right? So what we often end up doing is, is splitting our data, okay? Now, we may have different tricks about how to split the data, but we can use part of our data to evaluate the model and essentially make sure that it's it's performing well in some sense. In some cases, the split is random. In some cases, remember yesterday, I gave you an example of a stratified random where I was enforcing uh, certain distances amongst the points, right, with the ASPERA study. Um, and in some cases, you'll see in some of the papers that I've done, we do these crazy big spatial stratification where we say, okay, the left half, can that predict the right half? And things like that. So I'm not going to go into great detail about this, um, but there's a, there's a very interesting approach that can be implemented, and that is essentially where you take your full data set, this is called k-fold partitioning, k being a number, okay? And so here's our full data set. And we can, for example, um, take k equals 5. Okay? And so we take our full data set and we split it into five portions at random. And then we would use four of the five to predict the fifth. And then in the second iteration, we use a different one, one, two, three, four, to predict this one. And then the third one, one, two, three, four, to predict this one. Or we could change 10, k to 10 and have more but smaller portions. Okay? And the true extreme, we're going to come back to this uh, at the end of the morning. The true extreme is when you set k equal to your sample size. And that means you Essentially, if you have n observations, you leave one out, you use n minus one observations to calibrate the model, and you ask, could I successfully predict that one occurrence? And you'll see there's a paper that Richard developed that uh, takes advantage of that trick to be able to work with very small sample sizes. Um, but we'll come back to that in the morning. So, one thing that, well, let me back up just for a second. Um, essentially, what, what you're going to do in this situation is uh, compute a test statistic. And I'm not going to go into great detail about what those statistics would be, but essentially this is an estimate of predictive performance of the average across the five or the 10 the K tests, okay? And so this gives us a very nice uh, approach because notice that each observation serves as a testing point, as an evaluation point only once, okay? So bear this in mind, uh, the evaluation chapter is in our niche modeling book actually is a quite complete job of dealing with capable partition. So here's a bit of a reminder, and it's looking forward to a next bit of the morning. It's a reminder that most of the uh, testing approaches we use are based on some sort of threshold. If you remember this example is a salamander that Richard presented to you yesterday, and you have 
some threshold that goes from very narrow to very broad, and each of those thresholds carries with it a particular omission rate. So a very common approach would be the least training presence threshold. Okay, we talked about that yesterday. So this is simply the point that relatively rarely are we going to use the full round of predictions. Most of the time we're going to go through a threshold and step and to a, uh, a binary map. Okay? After I present Richard's presentation, I'll go on and give what I was going to give, which is essentially some approaches that do work from the whole spectrum of uh, predicted suitability outcomes. So, okay, this is going to be a bit hard. There's a line that runs like this. I hope you can see it. But essentially, the gray is the actual distribution and the difficult to see light blue outlines, this right here, uh, that outline is the predictions of your model. Okay? And basically these models can make a bunch of different mistakes and they have a bunch of ways of being right. So let's start by talking about how they're right. These X's and these X's are both within the the actual distribution of the species, those are the gray areas, and they're within the predictions. That, that blue line runs like this, okay? And so those are correct predictions of presences. Now, the models also can predict absence correctly. So the areas outside the distribution of the species are all of these white areas, and the areas that are outside of the prediction are the areas that are not within the blue lines. So all of this white area is correct prediction of absence. Okay? Then it gets to the error side. Sometimes the model predicts an area as suitable, which the species nonetheless doesn't inhabit. Okay? So we're going to call that a false positive. And sometimes, look at this and this, these are within the actual distribution of the species, but outside the predictions of the model. So those are uh, false negatives. Okay, there are a lot of ways of talking about the same thing. Uh, false positive and false negative are also referred to as a uh, false positive would be called commission error. And the easier term is a false negative would be termed omission error, leaving it out. Okay? So, these four kinds of error end up being the basis for essentially all of the model evaluation statistics. So we can summarize them in this two by two matrix, which is called the confusion matrix. And essentially what you're seeing is this is the actual situation, where it's actually present or actually absent, okay? And this is the predictions, present or absent. And so a correct prediction of presence is here, and a correct prediction of absence is there. And a perfect model prediction will have values above zero only in those 